change. <laughs> As uh, some of you may know, uh, even though I've retired from the police department, I have 28 years with the Chicago Police Department, praise the Lord. Amen. I had three years with the Sheriff's Department, so 31 years in law enforcement. I retired, and then I picked up a side job for security. Go figure. Anyway, but I uh, find myself having a lot of time to study, to read the word, and have You know, it is awesome to be able to get paid by a secular institution while I'm studying the word of God, preparing sermons, engaged in prayer, and they actually give me a check for that. Amen. 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 So I just thank God. Oh, is is a no, yeah. Okay. Yeah, my boss, my boss goes to my church, so <laughs> I remember saying that. And I had to look over and say, man, my boss is sitting right there. But anyway, I just thank God for the opportunity to be here. Great faith. Uh, they are family. And all of you are family. And I just thank God. I need to ask this question before I begin. Is there anyone uncertain or unsaved? And just raise your hand. I'm not trying to bust you out or anything. I just need you to understand my message today is not to exclude you. But my message is home specifically. And that's why I wrote some stuff down because I want to be clear. Is for the saints. Mm -hmm. We were here Friday, and Prophet Rido was so eloquent and moved in the power of God's presence in the house. And he dealt with leadership. And I don't know about you, but that message was so on point. <laughs> and he dealt with leaders. But as he dealt with leaders, I was, when we were leaving, I shared with my wife, I said, this is nothing but God, because God has given me a message for those who are not in leadership, those who are simply, I won't say simply say, those who are saved and, and, and just call themselves a pew member. There's some people that want to call themselves a pew member. A pew member. Pew them. They are pew members. So uh, this message is for basically all of us. Now, I want to draw your attention, if you will, bear with me, to 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, the 10th and 11th verse. I praise God for what he's doing in the midst. Uh, we had a wonderful worship service this morning. The man of God said he's got four hours worth of information. And he tried to preach all four hours. <laughs> but it was good. It was good. It was good. But, uh, you know, I told him, you didn't have to try to do it all in one city. We'll, we'll, we'll ask you to come back. saying that to let me know how long we're going to be here. I'm just saying. That. Amen. 2 Corinthians 8th chapter verses 10 and 11. The Apostle Paul had established churches in Corinth and he's making a request to some of the other churches and he's responding uh, to the people in Corinth. And he says in 2 Corinthians the 8th chapter but I said 10th and 11th verse. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye had. Now, that's the King James. Let me read it in out of Ben's Bible so you can understand what I'm saying. 
This is the best translation. I'm telling you what I think you should do about this. Because it is best for you. Last year, you were the first not only to do something, but to want to do something. Now finish the job. You were eager to undertake it in the same way, finish it as well as you can. All right, I thought I might share that translation because it clarifies a little bit what Paul was attempting to say to the church at Corinth. And I want you to excuse my advice right now, but I want to just use this as our point of meditation. Don't start nothing, and there won't be nothing. Don't start nothing, and there won't be nothing. You know, there was a phrase, this phrase was used by many of us probably when we were in grade school. The phrase goes, don't start nothing, won't be nothing. And that phrase was unfortunately spoken at adverse, under adverse conditions. That phrase was usually spoken under conditions of uh, duress and potential uh, schoolyard conflict. But when I assess that phrase with a spiritual understanding, when I assess that phrase with a spiritual eye, I perceive the phrase could apply to every aspect of human endeavor. I want you to consider that for a minute. For a minute. Consider that phrase. You know, it is important for us to be able to uh, look at life through the lens of the spirit. Uh, I'm talking to some Christians right now. I just want y'all to understand, I'm speaking to same folks now. It's important for us to examine life critically through the eyes of the spirit. You know, there are messages that we can look all over if we have the spiritual eyes to see. God has a word for each and every one of us struggle to achieve, to make your mark, to be of significance, to be a contributor, to be productive. All of us want to be productive in life. That phrase is a metaphor that assesses the fact that if we never start the journey, we could never reach the destination. If we never engage the task, we could never accomplish the work. If we never pursue the purpose, we can never realize the vision. Don't start nothing and there won't be nothing. If we never put the plan in motion, we will never see the project. I want you to hear me now, saints of God. Now, I feel it necessary right now. That's what I put on this page. Feel the need. I feel it necessary at this juncture to outline my objective for this message. Now, I know it is necessary to preach the gospel with clarity and truth. I know it is vital that all God's people know and understand that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus the Christ. I know we all need to be assured that our sins which are many, have been forgiven through what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross and died, was buried and rose with all power. I know we all need to trust that we are one with God because of Christ's atonement. I know this good news message must be preached so that every sinner comes to the knowledge of repentance and gets saved, but my message today is not specifically geared for the sinner. My message today is directed 
to those who allege, who claim, who suggest, who infer, who imply that they're saved. And you see, a lot of people say, I love Jesus. A lot of people say they have a relationship with God. But it is imperative that we understand what that truly means. The message this morning was given by a gentleman who said, he was dealing with uh, John 15, he was talking about John 15, I believe it was John 15, 7. It was talking where Jesus Christ said to the disciples, abide in me. I will abide in you. You all gotta go read that for yourself. I'm not, you know, I'm good at that good. But it was just talking about how it is imperative that as a man or woman of God, that the presence of God be living within you. That's what it means to be at one. And see, my message today is to those alleged who claim, who believe that they are Christians. I want to talk to these individuals who uh, confess with their lips Jesus is Lord and who say they believe that God raised them from the dead. I want to speak to those individuals who walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible is clear to express that humankind cannot possibly attain to righteousness by our own merits. The Bible is clear to express that our best efforts to do the right thing fall short. The Bible is clear to express that good works, your good works, are not good enough to get you to heaven. That's why the Bible is clear to express Jesus, the Christ, as the only hope of salvation. Jesus says himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man, woman, child cometh unto the Father except by me. The Bible is clear about salvation. And I, as an apostle, I, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, I, under the obedience of God, I, hearing from God, want every man, woman, and child in this place to come of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just because you heard the word, but that you live the word upon the earth. Yes. The people of God need to be a living expression of the presence of God upon the earth. Yes. When they see you, they should see Jesus. When they hear you, they should hear Jesus. My message is for the same today. And I ask the same folks today this simple question. What have you been doing since you've been saved? What have you been doing since you've been saved? Understand me. You cannot work to earn your salvation. But after you are saved, there is a work for you to do. Hear me now. Salvation leads to sanctification. And sanctification will lead you to service if you really love God. Now, I'm not talking about nobody. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. All right? Because I don't want nobody's feelings to get hurt. See, in Ephesians, it informs, informs us that the ascension gifts, the five-fold ministry gifts, the ascension gifts are given to the church for the what? The work of the ministry. Jesus calls on all believers to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send laborers into the vineyard. And he admonishes believers to work while it is day. For night comes when no one can be work. Why would he say that? He wouldn't say it to a bunch of people who didn't believe in him. He wouldn't say it to a group of individuals who could care less about him. Jesus was saying these words 
in the midst of a group of individuals who gave up everything in their lives, walked away from businesses, left their families, walked all over the countryside for three years with him, and he said that to them. So what is he saying to you? What have we been doing since we've been saved? Since we've been saved, you don't start nothing. Unfortunately, the church, our families, even this country, has been plagued and paralyzed by a set of twin spirits whose sole purpose is to hinder progress and destroy dreams. Twin spirits that promote apathy, twin spirits that plant seeds of slothfulness, twin spirits that deaden your drive and subvert your dreams, twin spirits, I'm talking about procrastination twins, I'm Owen Figma, y'all know I'm Owen Figma, <laughs> Amo and Figma are the identical twin spirits. Amo and Figma. I'm just going to leave that there because see, somebody knows Amo and Figma. Twin spirits that are of procrastination that attach themselves to your dreams and embed themselves in your conversation. Twin spirits that never allow you to experience the personal satisfaction of seeing a task all the way through. Amo attaches to your dreams and never lets it become a reality. Digna attaches to your conversation and never allows you to speak positive words of victory in your own life and never allows you to punctuate your possibility with the powerful words of God. I'm all in thing. Procrastination twins. The only way to overcome the spirit of procrastination, the only way to defeat I'm all in thing is by faith, the power of God's presence, and by the spirit of God. Now, I want you to Praise God with me because God has spiritual angels at work in our behalf. And I'm thinking of two spirits right now. They're called grace and mercy. Twin spirits. Interchangeable spirits. Twin spirits that look at each and every one of us just Thank you. 
pages, y'all. And I had to read, I had to word this correctly because I didn't want y'all jacking me before I got out the building. The only way <laughs> to overcome the spirit of procrastination, the only way to defeat Amo and Thigna is by faith in the power of God's presence resident in every true believer. The only way to overcome Amo and Thigna is through the renewal of your mind, through uh, uh, the transforming of your understanding. The only way to be delivered from the grasp of these interchangeable twins is through faith birthed in the Holy Ghost. Impregnating, impregnating you with power. I just want to use that word, impregnating you with power. See, women can understand this word. Guys have a problem with this. Impregnating you with power. And some women might want to get pregnant. Others, you know, you ain't feeling this thing. But impregnating you with power. There is one thing I know. We have to be pregnant with the power of God. Amen. Now, let me clarify a minute, because I don't want to lose the men in the house. Impregnate, it means to plant a seed, to impart or make a deposit. It suggests that what is produced by that seed or the character, compassion, and nature of what comes forth from that deposit will be similar to or the same as what produced it. In the natural realm, with plants, we call it pollination. When a daisy is pollinated, it produces another daisy. In the natural realm, when we consider the Budweiser Clydesdales, when two Budweiser horses come together, we call it breeding. And they produce a Budweiser Clydesdale. Well, not necessarily Budweiser Clydesdale, but another Clydesdale. All right? And when two people come together, they produce Church. 
as fast as they can. <laughs> Don't take all that. Oh, Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Preaching this morning. I didn't stand up, didn't do nothing. Let them just go on and whatever God. Until the musicians came over and started playing, then they realized maybe I am a little too long. <laughs> Y'all start playing, then I know that's my cue. <laughs> Right now, the word but 
allows a believer to proclaim according to faith. I may not have all the resources I want, but my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. I may not have the courage to speak a prophetic word that will encourage someone's life, but God has not given me the spirit of fear. And if I don't praise him right now, the rocks will cry out. You see, we have to have an understanding of the blood that we got. A lot of us got a butt. All of us got a butt. I want you to think about your butt. I want to think about your butt and how you used to be. I want you to remember your trifling butt. I want you to remember the butt you had before you met Jesus. Church. 
church etiquette. I'm like, well, all right. Yeah. They didn't get the church etiquette. They didn't have anybody to show them how to come to church and, and read the word and, and how to give to the minister. Oh, the mic got loud on that part. So, give to the minister. They didn't have people like that. So if they didn't have anybody like that, who do you think is going to tell them? I want each and every one of you to understand something. Now that you're saying you are called a priest, we are all a part of the priesthood of believers. If you don't believe me, read First Peter. We are all a part of the priesthood of believers. And God is holding the priests accountable and responsible now. God is holding the priest. Read Ezekiel 34 if you don't believe me. Read it. It's, it's important for us. I want this to be a hallelujah message. I want it to be one of those where we just run around and go, but you know what? It's fine to pat folks on the back. I've been around seven years, going into eight. Eight is the number of new beginnings. Let's start something new, fresh, something that has never been done before. The God was talking about new this morning, unprecedented. No paradigm to establish that thing. That's what it is here. God is allowing us to move in a new direction. Let's stop getting caught up in that old stuff. Let's stop getting caught up in those procrastination twins. I'm more indignant. In fact, let's kill it in the name of Jesus. Let's bury it in the name of Jesus. There's some personal endeavors. That's stuff that you were supposed to do in your personal life. And you've been talking to I'm more indignant and ain't never got that thing done. You need to go on and write the book. You need to go on and start the business. You need to go on and do, finish your schooling. You need to go on and do what God is calling you to do. Grace, mercy, the presence of God, that's what we need to embrace in our lives. And understand something. It's just what the words say here. What does it say? Don't start nothing. Won't be nothing. God bless you.